Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Southminster Church on this fourth Sunday in Advent. We hope that each of you find this to be a meaningful and joyful worship experience. If you are joining us online, please bring your own Christ candle and we will light them together. When there is an asterisk, please stand. Responses in bold are spoken in unison. At the end of the service today, please stay for a minute or two for a very special announcement. Please keep praying for your wayfinded team. Some really wonderful things are coming from this. Today is the day our Christmas luncheon will be held immediately after worship in Fellowship Hall. This is our church family Christmas dinner, and it's going to be a good one. A blue Christmas service on December 21st, that's this coming Wednesday, will be held at 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary. It is a service for all who sometimes may struggle during the holidays with grief, disappointment, discouragement, or loss. Next week, we will have a brief service of scripture and lessons and carols. There will be no brunch. We will definitely be on Zoom, however. I think there's some other announcements. Hey. I'm going to walk around. Okay, I'm going to walk around, so I don't know how this is going to work. I'm going to demonstrate how we donate to our Christmas giving this year. We have three different groups that we're giving to. One is farm animals for families in third world countries who need a way to make a living and a way to eat. So they're, they're taught, they may be given a flock of chickens. They raise the chickens. They're taught how to raise the chickens. They have eggs to eat and they have eggs to give away. They're, then our next one is the joy offering. And that one has kind of changed over the years. At this point, it's for any retired minister who has financial needs or any current minister who has financial needs. An example is one who became disabled and they needed access for him at the church. So they can just put if it's a current minister who has different needs and needs help, they can get help too. Um, and then the third one is for um, babies, and it's for nurses who are um, visiting babies at home who are high needs babies, and they take diapers and, you know, necessary items to those families. So um, this time I'm going to do a joy offering one. So I have my check. The white Christmas tree is for the joy offering. I have my check. And then after, later, I'm going to sign. Yeah, there's a little thing up here where you write down what you were donating. So that's the way you do it. Thank you. I'll take one of the farm animals. <laughs> The Lord be with you. Today we're going to hear the quieter Christmas story. We're going to hear Joseph's version from Matthew. Joseph quietly teaches us about love that takes risk, love that steps up, and love that hangs in there. Joseph goes from being betrothed to being betrayed to being an incredible blessing and an integral part of who Jesus became. After all, if Jesus invited us to call God Abba, Father, which is Daddy, I imagine Joseph had something to do with that. Let's worship together.
Please join in our call to worship. Across the universe, creation waits for the prophets to speak, their words of expectation and their vision of renewal. May we gather around them today once more and let their longing grip us and lead us into birth and blessing. So come now, my friends. This is the meeting place. Prophecy and prophecy. Let us listen through the ancient words that we might be ready to hear a baby's cry. Lord Jesus, master of both the light and the darkness, send your Holy Spirit upon our preparations for Christmas. We who have so much to do seek quiet spaces to hear your voice each day. We who are anxious over many things look forward to your coming among us. We who are blessed in so many ways long for the complete joy of your kingdom. We whose hearts are heavy seek the joy of your presence. We are your people, walking in darkness, yet seeking the light. To you we say, come Lord Jesus, amen. Please stand.
Please join in our prayer of confession and assurance of forgiveness. We cannot come before God unless we are first honest with ourselves about who we are, about the mistakes we make, and about how well or poorly we care for others. In this spirit, let us offer our prayers to God. Lord God, Lord God our, our lives, lives are, are filled, filled with sin. sin. We forget our neighbor's needs and do not love you above all else. We need a Savior. Help us to be ready for Jesus. O come, O come, Savior of the world. People of God, Jesus Christ our Lord, whose coming we announce this season is our righteousness. In Christ we are made right with God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Glory be to the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. seated. Let us pray. O oh God, our beginning and end, by whose command time runs its course, bless our impatience, perfect our faith, and while we wait for the fulfillment of your promises, grant us hope in your word. Amen. Our first scripture reading is the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He lets me rest in grassy meadows. He leads me to restful waters. He keeps me alive. He guides me in proper paths for the sake of his good name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no danger because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they protect me. You set a table for me right in front of my enemies. You bathe my head in oil. My cup is so full it spills over. Yes, goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the Lord's house as long as I live. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. We could get the kids to come up and join us for this anthem.
right, I am very proud of you. The kids can just come sit in a row right on the steps, please. We'll let the adults. Oh, hey, Ada Lynn, can you scooch right over this way? Thank you, scooch, scooch, scooch. And we're gonna move this for you. Scooch over there by Obi, Aaron. And this, this is an audience participation children's time. All right, friends, what we're going to do today, Bethany's going to go around all of your parents, grandparents, et cetera, et cetera, and find out how you got your names. So I'll tell you how I got my name. I was named after the Beth in Little Women. The one who burns. Anyway, um, so let's start. Andrew, oh, I gotta stay in the right place. Andrew and Aaron. So, Katie and Kenneth, how did they get their names? <laughs> we just came up with it. It's a good name. It's good. Well, biblical, good and biblical name. Like Daniel too, right? But. Yes, his middle name is a family name. Okay, Andrew Daniel. It's the biblical name that we like. No. Um, as far as Aaron, um, because Andrew, an e, I think I kind of wanted an A. Um, my sister's middle name is Aaron, E-R-I-N. Um, James was my father, so he became Aaron James. I like it. Okay. Let's go right behind Katie to Ada Lynn's grandparents. How did she get her name? Ada Lynn's last name is Brewington, and that's a long last name. And so her mommy wanted her to have a short first name, Ada. And her middle name, Lynn, is also my middle name, her other grandmother's middle name and her mommy's middle name. So she carries Lynn too. That's nice. That's great. Okay, let's go to go back to Eli's mom and Obi's mom and dad. Oh, oh Obi, you can sit back down. Um Obi is named after my great grandfather, who's Obi was Obi Lillard uh, Whitman. So he's named. What after about him. Lula? Lula is named after Adam's great grandmother, who was uh, Lula. So that's great. Eli is named Elias, and Elias was Walt Disney's middle name, and that is how we chose Elias. Okay, and then I think we just have Pete and Kim up here. Hey, Aaron. Whoa, watch out for the plants, guys. Okay. CJ is, his real name is Calvin Jonathan, and Calvin is the name of Kim's dad. And Jonathan is a combination of my Uncle John and my brother Nathan. Mm -hmm. And Will's, Will's first name is, we just like the name William, but his middle name is James Calvin, which James was my dad, and Calvin is Kim's dad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So why would I ask about your names? Because Well, I'm going to tell you why. Because today in our scripture story, we're going to hear about, Joseph, about Jesus' adopted daddy, Joseph. An angel came to visit Joseph, and he said, Sorry. give this baby the name Jesus, which means God saves us from our sins. So names are important because that was what Jesus did. Let's have a prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for saving us. Thank you for coming to be one of us. We love you, God. Amen. All right, Miss Kiana has big plans for you, I have no doubt. You gonna go with Miss Kiana? You can go with Miss Kiki, Ada Lynn, if you want.
my mother and I frequently had the conversation, why Beth? Why the one who dies? And she says, inevitably, she's the sweetest one. And I'm like, but she's also the deadest one. <laughs> so we've made our way around the Advent wreath again. All four candles are lit. We've learned about hope from Habakkuk in the beginning. We learned about love from Esther and joy from Isaiah. Today, we lit the candle for peace. Supposed to be the candle for peace. But Advent is something that was made up in the Middle Ages anyway to help people get ready for Christmas. All the colors and stuff were made in a time before many people could read. And so there was all this kind of code going on. So people got ready for Christmas with purple, sometimes blue now. And Jesus was actually probably born about three years later than we thought, and probably in April, not December. So I feel really free to change this from peace to love because that goes better with the scripture. And the scripture wins out over the purple and the candles and stuff. So we're going to talk about love. We all have times when we are hard to love. And we all have times when we struggle to love those around us well. It's not going to hurt any of us to have another sermon about loving like Jesus. And if you've absolutely mastered that, you can doodle on your bulletin. But if you have something to learn about loving like Jesus, lean in. Now, when we talked about love the first time with Queen Esther, we focused on how agape love, God's love, puts the needs of others first, even when it's risky or costly. We talked about how Esther's love was fierce and daring. Today, as we look at this quieter Christmas story, Joseph's version, we learn that not only does this love put others first when it is risky, this love steps up when needed. And maybe hardest of all, this love hangs in over the long haul. Now I say this is the quieter version of the Christmas story because the actual birth of Jesus is barely mentioned. The writer of the Gospel of Matthew is much more focused on proving that God made all these promises about a Savior and those promises are kept in Jesus Christ. That's why in this passage, as so often in Matthew's Gospel, there's all this Old Testament or Hebrew Bible scripture and then G Matthew points out, and that's why we believe in Jesus, because Jesus fulfilled this prophecy. So Matthew makes very sure that we understand Jesus is the Messiah. And when you understand all the cultural cues, Matthew makes really sure that we understand this story is a scandal. From Matthew chapter 1 verses 18 through 25 from the Common English Bible. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ took place. When Mary, his mother, was engaged to Joseph before they were married, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man. Because he didn't want to humiliate her, he decided to call off their engagement quietly. As he was thinking about this, an angel from the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, Son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because the child she carries was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you will call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Now, all of this took place so that what the Lord had spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled. Look, a virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did just as the angel from God commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he didn't have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to his son. Joseph called him Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Now, whenever we read scripture, we need to remember that whatever we're reading was written by particular people in a particular context at a particular time and in a particular place. 
when we read with those things in mind, the stories in the Bible become so much richer and even more beautiful. And that's true for this part of the Jesus story as well. Matthew's gospel was written about the year 85, about 50 years-ish after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. It was probably written in Antioch, the one in modern-day Syria, not the one real close to here. That was about 15 years in that place where the Romans violently put down a Jewish revolt. The temple, the center of Jewish religious, economic, and social life, was destroyed. In the aftermath of that revolt and its squelching, the oppression of the Jewish people intensified, then, and Jewish followers of Jesus were increasingly unwelcome in Jewish community, which, not, which impacted not only their religious life, but their social and economic life as well. So this oppression, separating out, divided society, that's the world to which Matthew is telling the story of Jesus. It was a discouraged world where it was hard to be Jewish and even harder to be Jewish and a Jesus follower. This is the time and place into which Matthew wanted to be very clear that God became Emmanuel, God with us. So that's some context for the people who were hearers, the first hearers of this gospel. But there's also really important context within the text and the events itself. Matthew tells us Joseph was engaged to be married to Mary. Now, to be engaged or betrothed at that time and that place was far more than a modern engagement. A modern engagement is a social arrangement, but a betrothal in first century Palestine was as legally binding as a marriage was. Joseph and Mary were effectively married in the eyes of the world they lived in. They just hadn't begun to live together yet. That's why it's all so scandalous. When Matthew casually says, Mary became pregnant, Joseph is not only devastated because his future life has just crumbled to dust, he also has some legal decisions to make since he knows he's not the father of Mary's child. Joseph had the law and its punishment solidly on his side. He held all the cards here. The laws having to do with a woman who is betrothed or married and who becomes pregnant by a man who is not her husband, they're pretty harsh. In a nutshell, there's some ifs and stuff, but in a nutshell, the pregnant woman and the man who got her pregnant were to be put to death by stoning. Now, really harsh, we don't know to what extent that was actually carried out. They didn't keep the greatest records when they stoned people, for obvious reasons. But the point is, it's just not as simple as Joseph asking for his ring back and canceling the party. He had two options, go public and risk Mary's death by stoning, or to quietly cancel the marriage contract, divorce Mary, and try to put the pieces of his life back together. He chose the latter initially, and he needed some angelic intervention to get things back on track with Jesus' story of his birth. Hearing Joseph's story, we have a sense of, of the ball of dread and, and pain that must have settled in his stomach. Hearing the risks to Mary her precarious situation. We get a sense of how much God risked in the incarnation. God took on a lot of risk to become Emmanuel, to become one of us. So the angel goes to visit Joseph. And angels only get involved in human stuff, at least as far as the Bible is concerned, when there is some heavy lifting involved. It took a visit from an angel to explain things to Joseph and get the story back on track. So Mary and Joseph ended their betrothal, moved into one household as a married couple. What was that like? 
They lived in a small village. How did their small village treat them, gossip about them, react to them? When I understand this context a little more, I'm grateful to both Mary and Joseph for being willing to join God in the risk of being a part of this scandalous, outrageous plan of God's. We owe them a debt of gratitude that they were willing to set aside business as usual and be a part of something radically new in the world. We owe Joseph a little attention as we try to see what such love and faith put into action looks like. So I mentioned as we began worship this morning that the love God shows us in Jesus, the love that Joseph shows us in this passage is a love that is willing to take risks, a love that steps up and a love that hangs in. Let me explain. For Joseph, love meant taking risk, trusting that this crazy situation he found himself in was worth setting aside his own ego and his own pride, his own plans, his own assumptions for the sake of being part of something bigger than he was. Even with the significant help of an angelic visitation, Joseph still had to make this final decision to trust that in risking marriage with Mary, he was following God's direction. May we all have love that risks for the sake of God's big dreams for us, for our church, for our communities, and for our world. Love for Joseph meant stepping up when he could have quietly divorced Mary and gone about his life. Joseph stepped up and in doing so prioritized following God's leading above following tradition and the letter of the law. Joseph stepped up to follow God into uncharted territory for which all of his religious training could not have prepared him. And Joseph really stepped up in those last few words of our passage today. Joseph called him Jesus. When he gave Jesus a name, he claimed him as his child to raise. He gave this baby a family to which he could belong. Joseph stepped up by fully adopting Jesus as his own, committing to raise him. He also, by the, in that stepping up, stepped into a life bigger than he could have ever dreamed. May we all have love that steps up for those who need us, like Joseph stepped up for Jesus. Love for Joseph finally meant hanging in there. Love meant hanging in there for the day-to-day -day raising of this child he had adopted. Joseph chose to stick around and hang in there, which was far less convenient than going with the flow of what was expected of him. Anyone who has ever loved a child, whether they are your child or not, knows that all children have moments when they aren't especially lovable. When being the grown-up is really hard. Now, anyone who's ever been a child knows that you had moments when you were less than lovable. If you don't know of a time when you were less than lovable as a child, someone has lied to you. I'm just going to say that. Now, Jesus may have been absolutely ideal and lovable as a child, but even so, I'm guessing there were days when Joseph was tired or frustrated or arguing with Mary about whose turn it was to make the bed and stuff. Times when it was hard to hang in there. That's what love does. As I mentioned, as we entered worship today, when he was an adult, Jesus told us to speak to God like he did with the word Abba, which means daddy or papa, a term of endearment. The way that Joseph hung in there, keeping his commitment to Jesus, it must have had a lot to do with Jesus' invitation to see God as an intimate, loving father. Where might you be called to hang in there? In a relationship, a community, 
an organization. Now, let me be clear, this is not an endorsement for tolerating any kind of abuse or dysfunction, but it is an endorsement of hanging in there when a relationship to an institution, to a person, to a family gets hard. May we all develop love that hangs in there the way Joseph hung in there. And finally, love that does all this, love that risks, love that steps up, love that hangs in there, all of that gave Joseph the opportunity to be part of something that changed not only his life, but by extension changed Mary's life, Jesus's life, and made that salvation possible for us too. The ripples that radiated out from Joseph's choices were part of something miraculous and eternal. What huge good might we be joining when we choose to love like Joseph did? Love by risking, by stepping up, and by hanging in. May we have the faith and the courage to love like Joseph did. Amen. We want to turn our um, attention to um, generosity and stewardship. We were, someone asked me last week, why don't you pass a plate? And I said, well, to be honest, when we were two congregations in Telos, we didn't pass a plate because nobody carried checks or cash. And then when COVID happened, that seemed like a bad idea. Let's all touch something to get, you know, and now it's cold and flu season. So we just, we honestly haven't quite figured it out, but there is an offering plate up here. There's an old Christmas carol you might remember. It says this, what can I give him poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. Yet what I can, I give him, give him my heart. I want to invite you to pause for a moment of, of silent prayer, listening for God's leading, so that you might hear the ways in which God might be calling you to give of your time and your kindness, your love, your help, and possibly your finances, all as part of giving him your heart. Have a moment of prayer. Almighty oh, One, you have done in our doing great things for us, in us, through us. Holy is your name. Bless all we offer you, ourselves, our time, our love, our kindness, our help, and our finances, that through your grace and favor, they may be, you may be made known to all the world for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Please stand for the doxology. Glory to God, whose goodness shines on me, and to the Son, whose grace has pardoned me, and to the Spirit, whose love has set me free, as it was at the beginning, is now and ever shall be. You may be seated. We come now to our time of, of prayer and our
are there? Okay, somebody took the pastor's pen again. Anybody? <laughs> All right. Oh, wait. Nope. All right, I'll find one here. I have a secret box that, because who takes the pastor's pen? Okay. I have, I have cough drops, Kleenex, all kinds of things I might need. Um, we do have a prayer request from um, Lori Donaldson that her neighbors, Mike and Nancy Nitch, who saved Nathan's life, um, just lost their adult son to an overdose. And fentanyl that happens around us so much but our hearts we can we know their names we don't know all the names of the people who lose adult children but we know theirs and we can pray for them are there any on zoom any requests okay here in the sanctuary the reason we have you speak into a microphone is so that the people on zoom can hear you because if it doesn't go through the microphone it doesn't happen on Zoom. Barbara? Traveling mercies for my friends, uh, my neighbors from Guatemala. They're going back to Guatemala with the kids to, they're trying to get a visa for the mother to come here, the grandmother, and traveling mercies for them. Yeah. I would like to add traveling mercies for Mike and Lauren as well this week. Yeah. I'm sure we all have family who are traveling or friends. Judy? Uh, be with my sister, Terry, who's in the, been in the hospital a week now in um, Michigan. She's having uh, pancreatitis and also some um, issues with fainting that they're trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. And also my brother-in-law, David, has just had heart surgery yesterday or Friday also. The one who's married to Terry? No, no. Okay. No, she oh is not married to a David anymore. <laughs> okay. Duly noted. Kim. Um, I want to um, uh, let everyone know I'm very thankful to have Sandy here. And I'm so thankful that she is doing well and she is beautiful. And I love you. <laughs> Katie. Um, I've got a couple. So um, obviously Thanksgiving that, yes, we have a house uh, and that's wonderful to see. Um, Thanksgiving for successful surgery for Aaron, back to his Rambo self, prayers for me at home as I have to keep yeah. him for a few days. Um, also prayers for the Evans family, um, mom's, I guess, longest standing best friend, Diane, just lost her husband, Jack. I um, believe he was mid-70s. Um, he had a stroke at church mm. um, last, or this beginning of the week. Um, so anyways, it, he was a pastor and oh, he his family knows where he is. Mm -hmm. and but just prayers for them us family friends whoever mm -hmm. um i think that's it mm -hmm. there we go. Yeah. are there any others miss susan prayers for my sweet husband who's at home he's having a lot of trouble with his knee and we're trying to get that figured out but just prayers for him yeah are there others Oh, Pat. The usual prayers for all of those um, among us who cannot come to church, who, um, you know, we know that we miss um, John, we miss uh, Nancy and, and uh, Sharon, we miss, um, well, we miss... Um, Oh, who are all Jeanette and Steve? Um, I had Susan and Bill Bell over for lunch the other day. I terribly, I do miss them terribly. Um, a couple of just family things. These are selfish prayers here. Um, my granddaughter has broken both of her middle fingers doing gymnastics, and that's going to put a big, 
that's going to be hard for all concerned because mm-hmm. they're coming here for Christmas, we hope. Um, I guess the biggest one is I have put things in process to move to California. And so, you know, I'm giving up a lot. This is happening to those of us who are older. We're having to make changes. And it just so happens my family's all in California. So I've put things in process. It's probably going to take um, a year, maybe. We'll see. We'll see. I don't know. It could be 33 months. could be six months. But prayers for me as I make this huge change. And Thanksgiving for this church. I have been here for 50 years. So, and a number of you have been here for 50 years and we have been friends for 50 years. So this is, this is huge for me. Of course it is. It's huge. Let's go to God. And can I add one more? Oh, yes. And Uh, and sorry, go ahead. um, Please add Layla and her dad, Austin, to the travel mercies. They are coming. They're in, uh, Florida right now and they'll be coming back in a few days and I'd just like to pray for Sandy Sanburn and Meredith Hansel as they move I've been one of those people that they talk about on Facebook saying people are resistant to letting us go and that would be me and Kate Um, they're our best friends and I just wish them the luck and that God blesses their new home and uh they were really fishtailing last night in the snow. So there's a little introduction to the tundra, but um, yeah. just uh, blessings on them um, as they start their new life in Michigan. Thank you. Let's go to God in prayer. Holy one, be the light in our darkness tonight. As we have lit a candle for peace, we pray for all victims of violence personal violence, and horrifyingly huge violence of war. Grant that we might be peacemakers with you, bringing about your justice and mercy in our own lives and the lives of those around us. As we have lit a candle for joy, we pray for those whose hearts are weighed down by sorrow, for any who are grieving the loss of a loved one this season, for those who have faced natural disasters or illness, Grant that their hearts might be full of the light you came to bring, a light that shines into the darkest of places and brings joy where none existed before. As we have lit candles for love, we pray for those who do not feel loved, for those who struggle to love others. We pray for exhausted teachers, parents, grandparents struggling to manage the excitement of the season in the children they love. We pray for those who are facing loneliness this season. Grant that your transforming love might change us this Christmas and make us more like Jesus. We pray especially for those lifted up before our church family this morning. Pray for Mike and Nancy as they begin to walk the hard path of grief. We pray for traveling mercies for so many that were mentioned. We pray for Judy's sister, Terry, and her brother-in-law, David, that they might be restored to health. We join with Kim in thanksgiving for Sandy being here and doing so well. We thank you for um, Aaron's successful surgery and pray for Diane losing her husband, Jack. We lift up to you, Terry, and pray that they would find clarity about how to treat his knee. We lift up all who can't be here. And we lift up Pat's granddaughter that she might have patience with the limitations that are coming. And our hearts are heavy to hear that Pat is planning a move, but we pray that you would make the way smooth before her. We lift up Anissa with Anissa, Sandy and Meredith as they move and pray that you would bless them in their new home. God, as we have lit a candle for hope, we pray for those who feel hopeless. We pray for those staring down difficult realities, for those who struggle to feel hopeful in the midst of too many crises. 
Grant that the hope that survives the bleakest seasons might be theirs through your Holy Spirit. Holy One, be the light in our darkness that we might reflect your light into the dark corners of our world. For you, Lord, my soul in stillness waits. Truly, my hope is in you. Thank you for sending Jesus. Help us to receive him with hearts filled with peace, joy, love, and hope. And hear us, Lord, as we raise our voices together to pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please stand. Beloved of God, we've made it to the last 
week of waiting for Jesus to come. May starlight guide your steps toward places of wonder. May angels sing good news as you travel to the manger. May promises fulfilled in Jesus fill these days as we watch and we wait for just a little more. And may Jesus, God becoming one of us, for love of us, be born anew in you. Amen. And right after we sing the benediction response, if you'll be seated for about 30 seconds, we have an announcement. be seated and Jen if you would put up the slide with the old logos these are our old logos from when we were two congregations um, the Southminster logo was notoriously hard to work with for anybody doing social media graphic stuff and tell us we were um, we became one congregation we decided on the name Southminster Presbyterian Church because here in Nashville, we are surrounded by all these really cool churches with one name, and we're not trying to be that. We're trying to be us. So Southminster Presbyterian Church was never cool. It's never going to be cool, and we are leaning into that. So, but we are a new thing. We are not what Telos was or what Southminster was. We are something new as we have come together in one congregation over these past tough years. So we needed a new logo. Pete, Jamie, and I formed a team and worked with a graphic designer, and here it is. There we are. It's um, a combination of the two. We thought it was a good fit. So, Saturday night, 5 o'clock, no rehearsal Christmas pageant. It's going to be great. We'll end with candles and silent night, of course. Sunday morning, um, I understand if you are home with your families, of course, but I will be here, and Anissa and Forrest will be here, and I think Andy will be here, so you can join us on Zoom if that's your jam. Let's go have lunch.